welcome to Jerusalem. I'm Daniel Felt. This fascinating and ancient capital of diverse identities and passionately held sacred traditions that are often in contact, frequently in conflict, and almost always united by a shared sense of rupture, displacement, and national return is the perfect place from which to address my topic for this presentation. Refugee narratives in children's books about distinct but related historic events. In this paper, I'll offer a framework for discussing children's books about the kinder transport of 1938-1939 and the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe of the past decade in related conceptual light. We'll talk about a framework for reading children's books about the kinder transport of 1938-1939 and the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe of the past decade in comparative light. We'll explore the social, political, historical, and literary ramifications for reading children's books about these different events in a united conceptual framework. I'm grateful to our conference organizers for their patience and persistence in offering us this virtual opportunity to gather, and to you for your time and attention. So let's get underway reading The Child in Time, Refugee Narratives in Children's Books about the Kinder Transport of 1938-1939 and the Syrian Refugee Crisis in Europe that peaked in 2015 and 2016. Let's begin by reflecting on the methodology of historic comparison. In recent years, the scholarly discipline of children's literature has dedicated significant energy and resources in closing the gap in research, examining and analyzing diversity in children's and young adult literature. While much more investment is certainly still necessary, those efforts have begun to bear fruit, with a host of scholarly publications that assess differences of identity, gender, orientation, race, and class in children's literature. These select examples are evidence of that outstanding work. Accompanying this work has been a scholarly reckoning that certain forms of inquiry were missing from the scholarly record. A new journal, Research on Diversity in Youth Literature, was founded in 2018 to provide, in the words of Kate Slater writing on behalf of the editorial board in the inaugural issue, a space to foster intellectually rigorous scholarship that may or may not fit conventional modes. Moreover, this shift in scholarly interest and its call for diverse books is having an influence on children's books publishing, as more diverse and international books are becoming increasingly available for young readers, especially for small children. I'm pleased that this conference features participation from a representative of that effort from Switzerland, Biobab Books, one of the most active publishing houses publish pushing for diverse and multi-ethnic books in German-speaking contexts. This emphasis on diversity in both publishing and research offers a desperately needed and salutary synchronic account of childhood and children's books in diverse contexts around the world. This furnishes us with a much richer understanding of how children's literature is read and why it continues to be relevant across borders by addressing children without constraint to place or identity. This polyphonic study of children's literature especially helps us notice markers of difference and diversity within the children's books of our day. I'd like to suggest expanding that comparative framework by taking in not just the axes of identity and place, but also the axis of time. Are we justified in discerning temporal linkages in children's narratives throughout history? My comparative approach calls for a diachronic consideration of children's literature across time. While detailed historical accounts of children, say, in Victorian England, 17th century Prussia, or Civil War America, have helped us gain a nuanced understanding of children in specific locales and periods of the past, Seldom is that analysis applied comparatively to elucidate the differences and similarities among children not of different identities only, but also of different eras. My reading of refugee narratives from different periods attempts to do just that, by reading children's books about refugees from Germany 
in the 1930s against child narratives regarding refugees from the Middle East in the 2010s, I am proposing that we add considerations of different times to our study of different identities, traditions, and places. This may seem self-evident, as histories are inherently constitutive of identity. But child refugees are people who are stripped of their nation, their home, their national identity, and thrust into the maelstrom of historic turmoil. While we take a closer look at the history of children's books about the refugee experiences, with the examples of the Kindertransport and the Syrian refugee crisis, we should take aim at how to better attune ourselves to finding comparative motifs in children's texts that portray these traumatic events. We'll also come to understand why comparing these histories is both productive and problematic. Let's now look at the histories of these refugee events before turning to the books themselves. Following the November pogroms of 1938, known as Kristallnacht, many of the German Jews still in the country realized that Hitler and the Nazis were not about to be restrained by the German public or its elites, and hastily made urgent attempts to emigrate. Covert, rushed contacts between leaders of German Jewish communal organizations and their counterparts in British civil society, both among Jews and non-Jews, such as the British Quakers, quickly formed the movement for the care of children from Germany, later known as the Refugee Children's Movement. This non-governmental organization launched an operation to bring to the United Kingdom Jewish children up to the age of 17 from Germany and Austria, led and financed by private citizens, not official government agencies, who merely permitted the resettlement operation, but also insisted that adults be excluded and that the campaign be privately funded. The relief effort began in late 1938 and continued until just before the start of World War II, in September 1939. In total, over 10,000 refugee Jewish children imperiled by mass violence, racial persecution, and the specter of looming war were afforded sanctuary in the United Kingdom by private families and group children's homes. This was the Kindertransport. The refugee children passed through train stations and maritime ports on their journey to foreign safety and freedom. These children escaped the tyranny of the Nazis, but they also left behind their families and everything that they knew. Parents were not permitted to join their children. In many cases, the separation proved permanent, as the majority of the Kindertransport children never saw their parents again. Moreover, the foster care provided to many of the children proved strained. Ultimately, the Kindertransport was largely forgotten from public record for many decades, until its memory was excavated in the 1990s following the gathering of many former Kindertransport children and the discovery that some of the campaign's leaders, including Nicholas Winton, had never been recognized for their foresight and courage. Winton's own family had not even known what he had done by personally arranging the rescue of hundreds of children from Czechoslovakia. In the early 2000s, monuments such as these were erected at key sites of the operation in England and on the European continent, knightheads and awards were bestowed on Winton and other leading figures from the rescue effort, and the Kindertransport entered British public memory as an example of successful refugee resettlement. Then came the European refugee crisis of the middle of the past decade. Due to a confluence of factors including the devastating civil war in Syria, Continuing armed conflict in Iraq and East Africa and severe drought conditions possibly caused by climate change, an influx of over 2.5 million migrants sought asylum as legal refugees in the EU at the peak of the crisis in mid-2015 through mid-2016, a threefold increase over the previous two years. While Greece was the primary landing point for most of these refugees, Germany was overwhelmingly their destination. After German Chancellor Angela Merkel announced in September 2015 that Germany would open its southern border to refugees, over 1.2 million asylum applicants entered the country over the subsequent two years. A preponderance of these refugees were under 30, almost half were children younger than 18, and almost all of them were Arab Muslims. The largest contingent 
were Syrians escaping the depredations of that country's ongoing war. Scenes of desperate migrants passing through some of the same German transit hubs from which the Kindertransport had departed many decades earlier prompted consternation and associations of historical memory by many commentators about the historical parallels between the Kindertransport, the refugee crisis before the Holocaust, and the burgeoning Syrian refugee crisis of the decade. Images of child refugees, especially that of three-year-old Alain Kurdi's dead body on the Turkish coast in September 2015, galvanized a public response that often evoked the Jewish refugees of the 1930s versus the Arab refugees of the 2010s. In October 2015, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees mentioned the disastrous 1938 Evian Conference that abandoned Jewish refugees on the cusp of the Holocaust and admonished European leaders that, quote, there were things that were said that were very similar to the political mood of 1938-1939, unquote. The late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of the UK and Commonwealth and official spokesperson for British Jewry, said that the refugee crisis begged comparison to the period of World War II and called on the British government to undertake a contemporary version of rescue, like the Kitta Transport, by admitting 10,000 refugees into Britain in a symbolic nod to the 10,000 Kinder transportees. In May 2016, in the House of Lords, Lord Dubbs, who as a child was saved by the Kinder Transport, was even more explicit. He said, quote, We did it then, why can't we do it now? Unquote. He advocated allowing entry into the United Kingdom to refugee children with relatives already in the country. In Germany, the evocation of the past was even more charged. Chancellor Merkel's stance of open, open borders in late 2015 through late 2016 was assumed to be tied to the country's special sense of responsibility for the Holocaust. This helped ignite a far-right anti-immigrant movement and nativist party still ensconced in many houses of German government and an upswell of anti-Semitic activity. But it also drew an admiring response from allies and even former critics who saw the images of Jewish children, child refugees fleeing Germany forbidden in 1939, young Arab Muslims fleeing the Middle East toward Germany in 2016 as vividly related. Here was a chance for Germany in a small way to right some wrongs of the past. Perhaps the most resonant among comments noting a form of historical repair was a statement made by the late Ruth Kluge a survivor of three concentration camps and a noted author who addressed the Bundestag on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 27, 2016, at the height of the crisis. Speaking from the rostrum of the Reichstag, she congratulated the German government for its generous refugee policy at the time, which Kluger saw as reflective of an admirable acknowledgement of Germany's past. Here is the end of Kluger's speech. Dieses Land, das vor 80 Jahren für die schlimmsten Verbrechen des Jahrhunderts verantwortlich war, hat heute den Beifall der Welt gewonnen, dank seiner geöffneten Grenzen und der Großzügigkeit, mit der sie syrische und andere Flüchtlinge aufgenommen haben und noch auch. This country, which 80 years ago was responsible for the worst crimes of the century, is now applauded by the world for its open borders and its willingness to welcome Syrian and other refugees with such kindness and warm-heartedness. The widespread evocation of history as a commentary on and guide for the present is striking. It is almost as if the thesis of Michael Rothberg's multi-directional memory, a 2009 academic text about the relative uses of Holocaust memory in diverse post-colonial political contexts, had gone mainstream. As Rothberg argues, multidirectional memory refers to the underlying dynamic of memory discourses, which are not zero-sum, but rather based on borrowing, cross-referencing, and other kinds of echoes and ricochets, rather than as a zero-sum logic of competition, in which attention to one historic narrative means less attention to another. In Rothberg's A Comparative Account, the rise of global Holocaust memory has led to greater awareness of other historic traumas. Perhaps child refugees 
had sparked a moment of reckoning between the past and the present that was evident not only in politics, but also in the culture. Of course, not everyone agreed. Historian Jennifer Craig Norton, whose landmark 2019 book on the kinder transport is animated by the chance discovery of a trove of personal files documenting the lives of over 100 children saved through the effort and the difficulties of their carers and imperiled parents, warns against the reductive invocation of the kinder transport as an inspiration to current events. Apparent parallels between the recent refugee crisis and the kinder transport, Craig Norton implies, are facile and false. She is not alone. Historians at the University of Birmingham in the UK recommend the same bracing restraint. In Germany, noted journalist and political commentator Bernd Ulrich similarly finds attempts to link the events to be rash and unfounded. And so we've seen how the Kinder transport and the Syrian refugee crisis are both integrally related and historically unique. The question for us as scholars of children's literature that is begged by this example is how to consider children's books about the past in historically comparative life. Are we motivated by the multi-directional memory model espoused by Michael Rothberg or are we more concerned with the work of a scholar such as Jennifer Craig Norton that attends to the particularity and the specificity of unique historical events? Now, as scholars of literature, we need not necessarily subscribe to one view or the other, but these theoretical questions are important for us insofar as they frame our study and interpretation of children's books about the past? Do we put them in dialogic relationship with each other, in which events and their representations of memory are referring to each other and developing in a dialogic relationship, in which representations and memory of one event necessarily color our interpretation of the representations of another event? Or are we more concerned with the historical referent and details of unique historic circumstances? Of course, there is evidence in criticism of children's literature towards one view or the other. And as I say, we need not necessarily sign up for either. We're not compelled. But there is, a, there is scholarship that thinks of the past in this multi-directional, multimodal form, and there, is a, and there is scholarship that thinks about how specific events of the past are rendered in texts. These theoretical questions about the interpretation of the past in a potentially comparative mode are formative for our work as scholars of children's literature as we go further into an era in which our study of the child as an agent of power, a subject of powerlessness, as citizens and members of social arrangements and political bodies becomes all the more salient and prevalent. While certainly not all children's literature subscribes to this kind of idea, we are in an, we are in an age when the study of the child in a transcultural, a trans-historical, or a non-historical mode of child, children, and parents, the experience of, of Western childhood as a sort of universal phenomenon becomes increasingly a thing of the past. What I mean is to say that as we in place and in plot the child further in history, we need to think theoretically and self-consciously about how we introduce that study of the past into our mediations and deliberations on representations of childhood and children's books about memory. There is evidence, of course, in our study towards one of these models of the other towards the multimodality, the multi-directional mode of Michael Rothberg, and 
the specific particularity of historians such as Jennifer Craig Norton and those who would criticize any attempt to put events of the past in relationship with each other. What is unique about the refugee stories and this specific pairing of events is not only that they are so obviously in relationship according to some and yet so obviously different according to others, but also that the refugee experience rips the child out of a specific historical trajectory in one country and places the child into another somewhere else. That concern of how the child is thrust into political tension and resettlement will become crucial for how we read these texts. As we turn to the texts themselves, let's take stock of what we have discussed until this point. We've noted both the historical connections and distinctions between the kinder transport of the late 1930s and the Syrian refugee crisis of the 1950s. In addition, we sketched a theoretical model for considering discussions and analysis of the comparative mode of historical children's fiction, how to read in a multimodal, multidirectional fashion, and also with reference to historical particularity and specificity. As we turn to the text, we'll want to keep forefront in our minds how these larger theoretical considerations animate and energize our readings and interpretations of texts that refer to and represent historical events. For me personally, these questions are of ultimate significance in my work as a scholar of children's literature. I was initially drawn to the field, not having studied it as a graduate student, but rather having studied Holocaust literature, precisely because of the innovative ways in which scholars such as Adrian Kurtzer, Kenneth Kidd, Vidi Kokola, among others, were mobilizing Holocaust literature for children in order to address questions of psychology, children's development, and the repercussions of revealing trauma to the youngest readers. These questions were being asked and discussed in a very insightful manner, I found, that was not done in other forums and contexts in this, of the study of difficult texts regarding the traumatic past. And so reading works about the past in light of contemporary critical and social questions, which is always the lens on which we, address, we approach the past, is of crucial significance when we talk about texts about refugees. We're also talking about, um, I at least have in mind, the Donald Trump era United States policies regarding child separation, the future threat of mass uh, resettlement and dislocation, as well as the ongoing Western, especially European legacy regarding rupture, trauma, and refugees. We're never reading one event. Literature encourages us to avoid, as Chimamanda Adichie memorably said, the mistake of a single narrative. How though we couple narratives together and do so respectfully, faithfully, and insightfully is of equal significance. So let's keep these questions and these theoretical consequences in mind as we turn to the texts themselves and read a collection of children's books about both the Kinder Transport of 1938-1939 and the Syrian refugee crisis of the previous decade. The connections are those that we offer 
and the limitations we place on them are also of our own making. Let's turn to the test. <laughs> many children's books for various ages, recently published about refugees, I'd like to focus here on a set of four texts about the kinder transport and Syrian refugee crisis. Postkarten für einen kleinen Jungen, Postcards to a Little Boy by Henry Fawn from 2013, Bestimmt wird alles gut, everything will be alright by Kirsten Boyer of 2016, Liverpool Station, translated from the original German into English as my Family for the War by Anna Forhave from 2007, and Peter Hatlin's 2016 Jadi, Jünge, are representative texts that elucidate the central motif of the child refugee as a symbolic figure of social and literary transformation on par for the 21st century as the orphan was in the 19th. Postcards and everything are picture books, while Liverpool Station and Jadi are young adult novels. Postcards in Liverpool portray the kinder transport, while everything in Jadi portray the Syrian refugee crisis in Germany. Only Postcards is an autobiographical text documenting the author's own personal experience. Elsewhere, I've written about some of these texts and their preoccupation with recurrent themes such as epistolary forms, travel, and the tensions between personal authenticity and national identity. Today, I'd like to read this corpus in a comparative framework, disclosing a pattern of intergenerational address underlying historical children's literature that both invites and interrogates correspondence between the past and present when dealing with events of collective trauma and the evolving political context against which childhood and children's books unfold. Postcards to a Little Boy by Henry Foner, born Heinz Dietwitz, visually documents dramatic personal history. As a small child, the author was sent from his native Berlin to live with a childless, childish Jewish couple in Swansea, Wales, as part of the kinder transport. The book is quite literally a conversation between generations, for it reflects the boy's rapid transformation from German Heine to British Henry through postcards that were sent by the boy's widowed father back in Berlin. Fatih, or Daddy, mails postcards from the day that his only child leaves Germany in February 1939 until the day before World War II erupts and the overseas mail is disrupted. The father's voice fills an important gap in what Adrian Kurtzer calls the cracks in contemporary kinder transport fiction, which overwhelmingly focuses on mothers who let their children go. This text relates the story of a father who saves his son by losing him. It is a universal tale, but the book does not neglect the particularity of Foner's specific situation. Instead, the book's portrayal of Foner's story, a rather anomalous one marked by successful cultural assimilation and sensitive adoption, the Foner's, his foster parents, facilitated his ongoing contact by mail and phone with his father and kept photos of him and, the, and his family, as, as well as the original postcards, close at hand. The story avoids falling prey to reductive or facile exaggerations of heroic rescues sometimes associated with the kinder transport. Foner's book is also thoroughly genuine. These are authentic original postcards, preserved by the author's prescient foster mother, who collected and gave them to him as a memento of his father, who unfortunately perished in Auschwitz in 1942. Foner's side of the correspondence, his juvenile letters to his father, were not preserved. But the text goes beyond simply chronicling traumatic history and offers an intimate portrait of how refugee crises can rupture family ties and create new attachments of national belonging. The father's anguish to see his son is apparent in the pages of the book such as this postcard dated May 26, 1939. Dear Heine, today Daddy traveled to Hamburg, where there are many big ships. Unfortunately, I cannot yet come to you in England. Did you receive the latest frog card? Many greetings and kisses, your Daddy. 
the frog card accomplishes what the father could not be with his child. The triumph of the kinder transport was that 10,000 children were saved. The tragedy was that parents typically were not. In becoming refugees, the children were effectively orphaned out of love. Henry never sees his father again. This fate is foreshadowed in an ominous recurrent motif in the book. The postcards repeatedly refer to ships which signal the father's frustrated desire to escape Germany and unite with his son. These ships haunt the text and trouble the reader. The tantalizing prospect of reunion, a hope that is never realized, evokes the terrible cost that even a successful operation, such as the kinder transfer was to a, to a degree, exacts. While Foner's father, a prominent lawyer serving the Jewish community in Berlin, was instrumental in securing visas and escape for others from Nazi Germany, he could not gain his own visa. Foner says that he has no memory of taking leave of his father at the train station in Berlin. He surmises that he has repressed the painful memory, but he does vividly recall the dramatic moment when he and his fellow young travelers crossed the border from Nazi Germany to the Netherlands and became stateless child refugees. Here he is, in an interview from last year, speaking from Jerusalem, where he has made his home for nearly 55 years. Although I remember the journey very well, the, the train journey from Friedrichstrasse station, because we were in uh, one of those trains with compartments, you know, with a corridor down one side and compartments along the carriage. And uh, eventually the train stopped and doors flung open and people in uniform came in and started screaming and yelling at us. It was very frightening and did doing body searches. Um, and we have one little suitcase each up on the rack above our heads. Um, so they did a bit of body search and found nothing. But from g the girls, they took all sorts of jewelry. I mean, I didn't see it myself, I just learned that. And people had, uh, you know, diamonds and gold coins and whatnot sewn in their clothing, which presumably they mostly found. Uh, anyway, it was very uh, frightening and unpleasant. And um, then they went out and the doors slammed again and then the train moved forward a few hundred meters and stopped again. And then the doors opened. And that was the border between Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, the doors opened and there were ladies in white hats and white uniforms giving out hot dogs with mustard and something to drink. And you know, I've talked a lot of the, the, these uh, kids from the kinder transport, and that's what they remember. They remember those ladies in white giving out hot dogs. As Foner's testimony and his book make clear, the political aspect of statelessness is inextricably bound up with personal circumstances of rupture and family ties. The boats that ferried him and his fellow, fellow child refugees to sanctuary also signify the inaccessibility of rescue for their parents, as well as countless other Jews denied entry by the many countries that closed their doors to Jews on the precipice of World War II. A massive steamship shown on one of the final postcards sent August 19, 1939, two weeks before the start of World War II, kindles last hopes for an intergenerational reunion. But the father's heartbreaking final message, written in English in acknowledgement of the growing political, linguistic, and personal gulf between father and son, Foner swiftly forgot his German after arriving in Wales, admit the improbability of the two ever seeing each other again. The father still speaks to his son as Dear Heine, but the postcard is addressed not to Heinz Lichtwitz, but to Henry Foner. The child has a new identity, foster parents, a substitute language, and safety in an adoptive land. In writing to his son on the brink of war, in a foreign tongue, under a strange name, the father, Lichtwitz, concedes that he has saved his son by making him an orphan. The boy's survival is bought at the cost of his birth identity. This was this father's sacrifice expressed in his final postcard 
to his refugee child. I hope war will not come. If it comes, though, God bless you. The book's visual register adds another dimension to this impassioned range of emotions in the text. Postcards early in the book depict cheerful scenes of a garden gnome comfortably settled among his friends in a gemütlich or cozy, cozy new home, evocative of the book's, of the book's theme of resettlement. But happy images of, of tranquil domesticity are at odds with the sinister Nazi swastika prominently stamped in the center of the card above the father's handwriting. A winsome but devastating final image of the jolly gnome cheerfully musing on whether to board a rickety rowboat encapsulates this complex swirl of affect. Confronted by daunted, daunting risks, Foner's father dispatches his child on a perilous journey and saves his life by making his son a refugee. Yet under the extreme duress of the refugee child's predicament, parental devotion and love lead to separation and relinquishment. The impossible choices faced by families weighing whether to seek asylum by traveling over hazardous waters to foreign shores can be discerned in this postcard with its caption, Ob ich frage, do I dare? Do I dare get on that boat? Or do I dare not to? Eight decades after the kinder transport, such questions are still being asked. Foner's postcard contrasts with an image from a 2015 German digital book depicting an Arab refugee family assessing the risks of boarding a rickety boat in their flight from war-ravaged Syria. The parallels between these two images starkly exemplify the enduring visual potency of a cultural storehouse of images, such as pictures that transmit affect across place and time. This image represents a pivotal moment in Everything Will Be All Right by Kirsten Boya and illustrated by Lena Safar in this version and in other versions and printed by Jan Burke. It tells the story of Rahaf and Hassan, refugee children from the Syrian city of Homs. Does the family dare board that boat at a time of repeated maritime calamities, killing refugees in the Mediterranean? Do they dare brave the continuing airstrikes from the government at home? Any historically informed reading of recent children's literature makes it difficult to ignore the resonances of this crucial question in depictions of child flight from instability. Other correspondences between these children's books abound. The risks of travel remain great, boats persist as a symbol of danger, and new families are racked by doubts over how to secure their children's safety. The Schiff sah sehr klein aus und sehr alt. The ship, the boat looked small and old, Boy's narrator states. But once again, a paternal figure acts with brave conviction. Keine Sorge, no worries, the father tells his children. The boat is safe. In this case, he is right. The father's bold assurance calms his children and helps them survive the Mediterranean crossing to Europe. But the squalor accompanying the refugee experience does not abate. Flight still comes at cost, as smugglers steal the family's luggage as soon as they board the boat, and the loss of personal belongings parallels the family's loss of national belonging, felt acutely by the child protagonists who feel adrift in their adopted land. While the nuclear family in Boya's book remains intact throughout their odyssey, they lose their extended family, their language, and their national identity. Rahaf cannot speak German when she goes to school, and she struggles to befriend other children. Her difficulty in with integration in contemporary Germany is quite different from Foner's rapid assimilation in World War II era Wales, where he was a solitary refugee. But as in Foner's account, Boya's text highlights the sacrifice made by parents on behalf of their children. Rahaf and Hassan's father is the family member most bereft of identity in Germany. Stripped of his medical practice, language, culture, and his dignity, the papa becomes an unemployed, depressed, and displaced doctor unable to heal himself. He is a formerly proud and assertive father who is yet another refugee lost in the modern German fatherland. By portraying the audacity and courage of his earlier decisions, their narrative shows that his subsequent listlessness as a refugee dependent on the European state and barred from employment 
is not his natural proclivity, but an, a, a condition imposed by the restrictive laws of asylum. The depiction, moreover, of the depressed father late in the book suggests an affective correspondence between parents and refugee children. When daddy is so sad, the children are too, the text states. This insinuation that without the integration of parents into a new national identity, refugee children can also not be fully assimilated either, shows another correspondence between generations. The children are also not the narrators of this story. Boya, here speaking at a 2016 event in Hamburg, is neither Arab nor a refugee. Instead, she is a prize-winning German author of children's books about contemporary social problems, as well as a vocal children's rights activist. She recounts the true story that she was told by the pseudonymous Rahaf and Hassan, who she met in the course of researching her book, which appeared at the height of the refugee crisis in the past decade. Boya signals that the tale she is about to tell is genuine, but not hers. It is a representative story, but also particular. By identifying the characters as real refugee children with their own names, rather than as fictional inventions, this text establishes a level of irreducible foreignness and particularity that resists appropriation or facile comparison. Moreover, the book appears in bilingual format in both German and Arabic that deepens this intercultural impression. Like the statelessness of international refugees, this narrative has no fixed nationality. It is neither wholly German nor strictly Syrian. It addresses German children of the host society and young Arabic-speaking refugees who may find in the text affirmation that they are not forgotten, but with the title's sweeping promise that everything will turn out all right, the picture book exists in a liminal state between settled identities, languages, geographies, and political sensibilities. Like the people it portrays, Boya's book is still en route between final destinations, addressees, and attitudes. I'll only mention the YA novels in passing, but these more complex texts also offer instructive examples of how children's and youth literature can point to correspondences in history that transcend a discrete time or single event. This excerpt from Forehead's 2012 novel translated into English as My Family for the War about the kindred transport echoes the historical examples of the letters sent between Jewish refugee children and their parents trapped behind closed borders. But in my analysis, this excerpt may also be read as an appeal to history and a summons to seek out historically responsible, morally justified connections between texts with different histories that discern the appropriate relationship between them. In this letter, the protagonist's father urges his daughter Ziskla to embrace her refugee status. You'll learn a new language and, I'm sure, meet warm-hearted, wonderful people. Just think, some of the world are still men and women who don't watch what happens to us differently, indifferently, but instead take us into their own families. We know that the plight of the refugee is rarely that idealistic. But sometimes, as Peter Hackling suggests in Jadi Fruchtenjunge, his YA novel about a Syrian youth in Germany, a connection transcending one's own story and moment can nonetheless be forged even in the most difficult or desperate circumstances. The title character of the novel is somewhat absurdly housed in a group home for senior citizens in Germany, orphaned of his own parents, deprived of relatives from his native Syria, and traumatized by his Mediterranean crossing, 11-year-old Jadi is taken in by a group of six residents in a collective home for seniors. Over the course of the novel, he forges a connection with his flatmates, although that relationship is fitful, difficult, and often begrudging on both sides. Nonetheless, with the help of his older flatmates as mentors, Jadi ultimately comes to understand himself more lucidly. That is precisely the sort of framework I propose for historical comparison in children's books about difficult events, a cautious, sometimes difficult relationship that eventually leads to greater understanding. 
Dialogue among the generations is at the heart of children's literature. As we have seen, children's literature about young refugees crystallizes this dialogical element that is always present in children's books. How distinct but related historic events featuring child refugees illuminate each other without vitiating their own particularity demonstrates how to conduct diachronic research in children's literature across time. This research must be done in measured, responsible fashion, but if done well, can be extraordinarily productive. Narratives about child refugees portray children seeking new affinities, fresh models of kinship. In our own way, as scholars of children's books, we are doing the same thing. If we read closely and carefully, perhaps we too can come to forge our own correspondence between texts that bring discrete moments and separate histories into closer relationship. For children's literature is ever heading into closer and more insightful conversation about children in different places, with different identities, and with separate histories. Thank you for listening. I'm so grateful for your attention, and I look forward to your comments and questions.